So it is now um, 5.02 my time, but it is 11.02 everyone else's, or Eastern time. So we're going to get started. Um, I'm going to be recording the call, so hopefully the call recording will go well. I know sometimes I upload half it half videos <laughs> because it messes up halfway through but um but you're all here so all the people here will get the full experience of the call regardless but if you want to check back on anything the uh science lab youtube channel is where we upload all the calls and i tweet them out the links at least after the call usually like an hour afterwards because it takes a bit for it to propagate um can everybody hear me okay or is it not loud enough okay we're good all right sweet so, um, welcome to the call. Uh, the theme for today was going to be more about sustaining your group and developing a kind of mentorship program so that your group can outlive your tenure at a place. Um, often study groups are the projects of grad students or people who have a limited amount of time in one institution and after they leave, um, if they don't have a, a replacement person in place or if they haven't educated their community in how to continue running the study group, it can be challenging for it to continue to grow. Um, so I thought we would talk about some of those issues today. A um, Couple of things to note, if you scroll down um, to line 55 of the etherpad, that's where the roll call is. And if you could put your name and your affiliation and your Twitter or however you like to be contacted, that would be lovely. Um, I see there's a lot of people who've already put their names in the upper right corner next to the color of their choice. You can also change the color if you want. Um, and I don't know if I ever go over this on the calls, but Moz Study, um, which is the hashtag that's on line 51, is usually what I use to tweet things that are related to study groups. So if you wanna follow that hashtag, or if you want to use it because you want to share a resource that you found today on the call, um, that's great. You're welcome to do that. And that makes it easier for me to find it and retweet it and give you lots of love and, and thank yous. Um, so if anyone um, has anything interesting to share related to the, today's topic for the call or not, uh, you can put it under line 67. Um, anything that you found on the internet that you think is of interest to people or um, worth sharing with the broader community is always welcome. Uh, I sometimes use this to um, to like fill our Twitter with some more interesting links from the community as well. Uh, so if you have anything to share, I put up academic pages because I thought it was an interesting project. Um, it's a it's a, just a skeleton of a website that you can use for your academic profile because every a uh, professor or academic usually needs to have some kind of web presence. Um, and it's a really nice template and it's responsive, which is great. Um, so that means you can see it on mobile. Uh, it's particularly oriented uh, towards single person pages. So a portfolio of like your talks and um, the classes you teach and that kind of thing. But you can change the labels however you'd like. And it uses the same framework that study group project uses, which is Jekyll um, on GitHub. So if you're familiar with setting up your own study group, then you can easily um, set up your own academic pages. And then I put in another, the Initiative for Open Citations, which is a project that Mozilla is supporting um, along with many, <coughs> excuse me, other partners, um, but you should check it out. It's pretty cool. Um, yay, I'm glad you like academic pages, Marcos. Um, cool. Um, I Heart Open Data also is our campaign. Thank you for adding that, Steph. Um, it's a, a campaign for anyone who's interested in um, advocating for the sharing of scientific research that's been publicly funded, which is probably everyone on this call um, and probably everyone in our community. But not a lot of people know that you know grant-funded projects sometimes are not shared back with the wider world. Um, actually, probably everyone here knows that. <laughs> But um, but share it with your networks and ask people to sign the petition um, because it's it, it's pretty cool and exciting and we're pretty proud of it. Um, anything else you want to share? Feel free to add it under line seventy three, um, and uh, we're gonna move along on the agenda. Does is anyone on the call new to our study group calls at all? 
Um, you're welcome to put your name and your affiliation under line 81. Um, I usually try to welcome the new contributors or message them afterwards. Um, it's pretty cool. Oh, yay, I'm glad you plugged the Method podcast. Thank you, Marcos. Yes, um, this is a, a project of um, April Clyburn Sharon. She's one of our Open Leadership Cohort members, and she attended our Montreal WOW, and she's working on a project to create a peer-reviewed podcast around open science and open science themes. And so you can subscribe to her newsletter um, and her website and how to get involved and stuff will be up soon because she's using her mentorship period in the Open Leadership Cohort to develop all of those materials and to launch the podcast. And it's actually especially cool because she spoke on one of our community calls last year about the idea for this project, but she hadn't made any of the templates yet. And now, um, now she's made quite a bit of progress and yeah, we're very excited for her. Um, so thank you for sharing that. And it's also um, way further down. I put it in the, some of the links for um, how to build and sustain your group because I think I'm going to suggest uh, sustainability of open science projects as maybe a theme for one of her podcast sessions. So if you're into that too, you can plus one on line 187. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but for now... Let's come back to the top. I guess we have no new contributors. I'm glad to see all of the people or notice that all of the people joined that have been repeated contributors. Um, but if you have anybody in your community that you think should join our future calls, uh, feel free to suggest them too under the new contributor section and I'll reach out. Hey, oh, thank you, Will, for lurking in the etherpad. Oh, I guess I shouldn't say that because he can't join. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that I always respond verbally to people's text messages in the pad. It's sort of embarrassing. And I wonder if sometimes the recordings are just a lot of Aurelia, like responding to things that no one can see. Um, but anyway, um, so uh, study group updates. Let's start with those, and then we'll get down to some resources for sustaining your group. Um, the U of T coders, I don't know if anyone is on the call because I think Madeline has a lab meeting during this time. But it looks like they've um, progressed with their intermediate lessons, which is very interesting, actually. If you've ever gone to the study group lessons repo and gone to the issues too, a lot of people submit their lessons and, um, and, and contributions back to the repo through issues rather than doing a sub-module um, like most of the lessons that have been vetted uh, by us. And also when they create curriculum that's slightly altered from the sub-modules curriculum but isn't totally distinct. Um, it's usually best to log it in the issues too. Uh, so there's a lot of ways that you can filter the issues to make or to search through the lessons and see if there's anything that you can reuse. And one of them is using tags um, that are GitHub labels and they have, I have a bunch of them <laughs> for lessons based on like the theme of the language or uh, the topic for a discussion or um, a beginner, intermediate, and advanced, so the levels. And if you're interested in finding intermediate lessons um, for like the, like the U of T coders have found or have created, um, in addition to like the beginner's topics that you might be approaching or you might kind of revisit every, I don't know, quarter or semester or how, how you, however you divide time for your study group, um, then you should check out those tags and try to filter by those tags. So it looks like they had a great turnout um, that's awesome. I'm gonna also plug um, the study group events repo um, probably a little bit later on the call, so stay tuned for that. But um, it's a great way to share back details about how your event went and, and any feedback you have for us about how we could help make your events awesome, more awesome. Um, great, so they had a happy, uh, hacky hour. That's, that's cool. Um, I'm just reading through their updates and everyone else can do that too while on line 100. Um, but let's skip down for now um, to Danielle. I guess she's the next person on the call. Looks like she's live updating too. Danielle, are you in the in the call or are you? She's on the WOW mentorship call right now, so she's just lurking. Oh, she's lurking. just lurking. Okay, cool. Um, well, great. Uh, Danielle's at Oregon Health and Science University. Uh, she's one of our Missoula fellows and she has a study group that's pretty awesome in Portland, Oregon. 
and she had a hacky hour, it looks like, on the 24th of March, um, coming up with a new schedule, and uh, she had some suggestions for lesson plans there, um, and it looks like either she is entering in text, or, oh, I guess Steph also entered in text. Um, and, and again, the crowd's doing weird things with colors. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, one of the new updates to Etherpad, I think, was that every time you make an edit on a line, it recolors the entire line for your edit. So even if you just edited somebody else's content, it used to just give you the sliver of whatever you'd added as your color. And now they just, you know, you overwrite everything the other person wrote, which is a great way to plagiarize. And I don't know why they changed that feature. <laughs> but, oh well. <laughs> We're just going to roll with the changes. Um, Oh, and also, that was Steph on the call. Uh, she's the director of the science lab, um, in case you didn't know, but most of you probably already did, and I think she's been on previous calls, too. Um, but um, it looks like, oh, she's, uh, Danielle's also reaching out to people to be guest speakers, too, or guest teachers, um, which is an interesting model, because I don't think a lot of um, study groups have that same structure. A lot of them have you know, a set list of teachers or contributors or people who show up regularly who want to teach a session and they have some standard curriculum for that person. But you can also use your study group to host guest speakers and invite people just to hear talks and give responses or to coordinate, um, I don't know, a, a journal club or something around a paper that they've written maybe, which might be terribly intimidating if you've written the paper and then you have to just sit there while everyone gives you feedback on it. But I think everyone's used to that kind of feedback. So it's not too big of a deal. Um, cool, cool. Uh, so who's next? Oh, Vicky, you're next. What are your updates? Uh, can I, yeah, so can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, that's great. Um, yeah, so I have a couple of updates. Uh, our study group has been, you know, catching a lot of eyes. And I'm getting a lot of emails from uh, a lot of people from the Mozilla India community and people who follow uh, Mozilla in India. So uh, at least I got like people's one name saying that, hey, you know what, you're doing some great activities in IoT, teaching technology to students and things like that. And uh, they were really inspired. So a couple of them uh, wanted to start their own study group. And I could uh, start off uh, when I felt one guy is really good enough. I, you know, I kind of forwarded a, a particular person to Aurelia. And I think he's, he's setting up a study group right now. So that's some updates from my side. If you're hearing some background noise, I'm probably in the railway station and it's pretty crowded here. So that's the reason of the background noise. So I'm not responsible for it. And regarding second thing, so we have been uh, working on an, uh, an AI crate in Rust. So I've been playing around with Rust for some time now. And then I'm uh, encouraging my uh, study group people to also start contributing to it. So that they say they find kind of difficult to contribute at the initial stage. So I'm, I'm kind of mentoring them and then asking them to uh, write an AI library in uh, Rust. It's a way of decentralizing things in the web because you see right now they are like market share of uh, TensorFlow or a couple of you know uh, publicly you know publicly open source libraries but controlled by organizations like Google and those big players out there uh, in machine learning also. So like I thought of building something uh, from a community end. So that's the whole idea of uh, getting that open project stuff. Uh, so we're working on that. So these are the two updates from my side. Thank you. Those are great updates. Um, and we're also very excited. Vicky will be joining us um, for our Moz retreat really this month. Oh, oh, sorry. Um, we're also very excited because Vicky will be joining us for our Moz retreat at the end of the month, where we're going to plan a Moz fest, and um, which is a, a, I guess, a global festival, but it's hosted in London that we have every year for all of the Mozilla. This year, it'll be themed around all the Mozilla Internet Health issues. So digital inclusion, open innovation, privacy and cybersecurity, um, uh, what am I, web literacy, and uh, decentralization. Hey, all five. Um, so <laughs> we're, we're going to have a great event, and um, he's going to help us plan it. He's one of the community members, so it's very exciting. Um, thank you for your updates. And Marcos, you're next. Okay. Hi, everyone. Oh. Well, uh, something really interesting happened, happened last week because I wasn't able to attend uh, one of our meetings. So 
uh, it happens anyway, and that made me really, really happy because I'm concerned about how how to to sustain the group. Uh, I mean, I might be be unable to to leave every meeting every month. So I actually put one of my students to to do that, and he gave a class about building maps with R, and it went great. I, I wasn't there. It went great, and that <laughs> made me really, really happy. I, I want my group to to be able to go on even when I can't. So this this was really great, and and that's it. That's the the, the news I have for now. We are uh, meeting once a month uh, for our our regular meetings, and we also have some kind of more tutorial meetings like class um, between them every now and then and this is great the, the, the group is going is, is going really really great right now I'm, I'm very satisfied and excited all right awesome that's great updates and, and very topical too thank you for talking about your yeah. ability to sustain your group in at least one meeting um or at least your interest in the theme too uh that's great i'm so glad your student stepped up um cool and i think we only have elizabeth do you want to share um what's up with your study group sure to Git and GitHub, which was really exciting, um, and more people came than expected. We had over 15 people, which was really exciting. Um, we have our next workshop planned. We have a member who's really, really interested in Inkscape, wants to do a tutorial on Inkscape, um, so we're going to do that, which we're pretty excited about. Uh, we're looking for a bigger room, which is also exciting. Um, yeah, and so that's, that's going well. We added those workshop materials with the UOT coders, uh, I think, on the Gitter chat they had said that they had this index page, so we took that HTML and added it to our own website, which was pretty exciting. Um, so things are going well there, and then, yeah, in terms of uh, sustaining the group, having similar thoughts, um, my timeline shifted kind of dramatically. I had started considering options a few months ago, and now it's pretty clear that I'm leaving Cornell in the summer. So having started the group in January and leaving in the summer, we're we're accelerating the, the sustaining push. So I'm bringing a couple of people on board who are trying to get the leadership side of it. So my questions are just in terms of like how best to, to help them and, and to keep it going. So, but things right now are great. Thank you for that update. Awesome. Um, I put in some brief notes around line 166 for you, but feel free to edit those um, and recolor it so that it's you and <laughs> not me. <laughs> um, and Francesca, do you want to also share a little bit about your group? You can also create to your own section. I, I just put in the sections from the previous calls. I never, um, uh, yeah, I, I usually don't add new ones, but you're all welcome to do that. Especially, I should probably put that as a note at the top. Yes, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll add a little bit of text in the other part in a second. Uh, so, yeah, it's actually going very, very well. We've had uh, two tutorials so far, and one was an introduction to GitHub, and we had lots of people interested, and I think a few of them are actually using it, which is great. Uh, then we had another one uh, that was all about visualizing uh, population change uh, and species occurrence of data. So very ecology based, but the great thing was that we were collaborating with the coding club in Edinburgh, which was quite nice. I, I like the uh, the first collaborative project of the Aberdeen study group. Um, and yeah, so we actually are planning a Python tutorial for I think it's in a couple of weeks. Uh, and there's a lot of people that want to actually that are actually volunteering for uh, leading the tutorials, which is great. <laughs> so we're very happy. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Um, cool. Um, so to kind of 
go through or start the discussion, I guess, around line 177 about how to sustain your group. Um, if everyone could put, uh, I guess, their, their greatest challenge in thinking about sustaining so that we can kind of, or that'll, we'll use that to guide um, what kind of suggestions and recommendations we make. So around line 179, if you just want to um, add in some ideas for what is your greatest challenge in sustaining your group or what's something you would like to have us help you solve, um, that would be awesome. And so we'll just do that for uh, like a couple of minutes as a silent music chat activity. Oh, hello, new person. Okay, great. Um, so there's only one suggestion. I don't know if there need to be more <laughs> before we proceed. Uh, if you have any like challenges or anything that you want to add quickly while I'm talking around line 183, um, these would be challenges to sustaining your group that you'd like to address. Um, meanwhile, we Occasionally, uh, we've done two rounds of this now, um, study group orientation series. So we, uh, Zana designed uh, a get book that goes through how to set up your study group, um, some of the logistics of planning events and soliciting contributors and that kind of thing. Um, but she also has a kind of in-person or over video uh, mentorship series that I, a few people on this call were part of in the past. There was one in November and there was one in January. And those are great resources, or at least the etherpads for those meetings are great resources to find out more about how other groups are sustaining their groups. In particular, um, let me add this one in. Uh, I think it's this one for January 17th. 
And then I'll put in the ones for November too. And there are two groups. So if you just, oh, what happened? Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, there are two groups. So I think you just change the URL uh, so that it references group one versus group two. Um, but the one at the top, uh, right next to the text on line 183 currently, is one where we talked about growing your group. And we invited U of T coders members to come talk about how they do it. And one thing that they highlight, uh, that they, they did highlight on the call, was developing an executive council, um, which is composed, I think, of uh, Madeline, Luke, Lena, Lindsay, a lot of L names. Um, and they all have different roles, and so I'll put the, the council roles here um, as well. Uh, so this is their framework for kind of structuring a division of labor in their study group and also electing people so they have elections and you can nominate people now. But if before that it was just whoever showed up the most often to the study group ended up getting talked to by Madeline and she was like, oh, how can you get more involved? Great, can I give you some work? That's awesome. Um, but uh, they have a very nice structured repo um, <laughs> that you should check if you're interested in learning about how they run their events and how they have semi-regular planning meetings with the exec team. So every quarter they come up with, or they send out a survey to everyone and ask, or all their attendees, and they ask what curriculum is of most of interest to you. Um, and then they go through that during their exec meeting and decide what they'll program for four months out. So they do this every quarter, I think. And um, they schedule all the classes and get all the teachers arranged in that fashion. Um, so that, that seems to work out really well for them, uh, and it keeps it from being overwhelming for one person, which I think if you're all the directors of your own study groups, you realize how quickly it becomes um, kind of overwhelming to, to manage the program and to keep up with it and to attend all the events and to make sure that everything runs according to schedule and planning. Um, so it's, it's really great to develop an executive council or whatever you want to call it. I also put in um, some links around line 193 um, about capacity building, which is sort of a buzzwordy term um, in, in nonprofit language, but there's some good links in that resource around line 194 about how to grow and sustain a mature um, organization or group. So you can apply that to even smaller organizations. And there's also some notes about building an advisory board or developing a mentorship program which are all things that could inform how to build a sustainable study group, I think. You don't need to like elect an advisory board to manage your student group. <laughs> that maybe seems like overkill, but um, the way that you assemble an advisory board and bring on trusted partners and members and people who have your interests at heart is the same way that you might solicit teachers um, to graduate to the level of the executive council or to help you a little bit more with event programming. Um, another cool way to sell it too is that I think, in my experience, being on the, the planning committee is way easier than developing curriculum and teaching lessons all the time. So if they're exhausted by teaching and maybe a bit burnt out, then um, you can say, well, hey, all you have to do is make sure that the venue is ready and schedule events, and you can do that from the comfort of your couch. Um, but sometimes you should come to the events too, you know, because you love us. Um, that, is probably not the sales pitch you should use, but <laughs> you can modify it however you'd like. And then there's and some other questions up here. Um, how to establish an executive board. Oh, so yeah, I would recommend checking out the executive or the council roles sheet around line 187 and think about which of those might apply to your project. They have roles like a treasurer and a secretary, I think, or at least they did at the last time I checked it. Um, and you might not feel like you need that, especially if your space is donated or if you don't really have a lot of expenses. But it can be nice um, when, I'm so sorry, that's so loud. Um, it can be nice to have somebody who's responsible for figuring out if you're gonna have snacks or coffee or whatever you want. Um, or if you charge you know, for your events, some, um, some study groups like have a like a donation pot or something at the door where you like donate to contribute to snacks or something, um, or just to get people to show up 
Uh, I've noticed in uh, our meetup, at least in, in New York for Girl Develop It, we have to charge at least $5 or something to make sure that people come and don't bail at the last minute after they've RSVP'd. Not all operations are that intense, so maybe you don't need um, that. But it's nice to have somebody who's responsible for those kind of financial you know, upkeep and, and calculations. Um, but you can call your executive board members, whatever you'd like. Um, and the council roles are a good guide. Uh, we had a class-like meeting. We found that having new people join. Actually, Marcos, do you want to talk about this question? I feel they should have asked that before. Yes, actually, I, I was now looking at this because I, I believe I, I should have written that under the tips below. It's not a question. It's more like something we found out during our, our meeting. But anyway, uh, it's just that um, since we sometimes have meetings that are actually classed about uh, uh, specific things, we found that this is very useful to attract new people to our group because a lot of people that are not in our group will attend then a few of them will actually get interested in the group and will join and having uh, new people joining every now and then is great and it's certainly a nice way to sustain the group but it was not a question sorry <laughs> it's okay <laughs> It's okay. Uh, <laughs> and Francesca, do you want to um, talk about your question? Sorry, oh, it takes me a couple of seconds to <laughs> unmute me. <laughs> okay. um, so, yeah, uh, I was talking about this collaboration that we have going with the East Edinburgh Coding Club, and they're very lovely people to, uh, to work with. We're thinking that you know this time they came here because they actually have funding. But uh, if for another time we would like to go to Edinburgh, uh, we wouldn't know where to find the money. So uh, I've been looking online to try and find some small grants to see fund this kind of project. But I I actually have no idea where to look for it. So I wouldn't know whether it would go under some kind of an innovation innovation grant or I have no idea. So if anybody has any. Sorry, I was muted. Um, yes, actually, uh, we have some very exciting news upcoming, um, and maybe Steph wants to talk about it too, but we're going to be launching a mini grants program, and um, one of the application categories that you can apply for funding under is um, hosting events or um, community, and so study groups would qualify. And um, But in terms of external funders, um, if you have a nice, if you have nice documentation on your little study group website of what you do and what you're about and why you support open science or whatever the theme is for your study group, uh, usually I reach out to like local tech companies because those people usually have a like discretionary budget that they can give to open source related events or things that they might ask you to put like their logo on your in the, your footer of your site or something. Um, or allow them to give a presentation at the beginning of your study group. But you could soft reach out to them and say, oh, hey, we have a study group. It's mostly coders and you know scientists and researchers, and we'd like to showcase whatever your tool is, like maybe it's GitHub, maybe it's something else. Would you mind sending someone to come speak about it? And usually they'll come back and say like, oh, yeah, and we can give you some swag, and we can, um, I don't know, sponsor the coffee or food at your event or something. Uh, and th that can be challenging to manage, like those kind of collaborations with other organizations. But I usually keep, for Girl Develop It, I keep a little spreadsheet of p people I've reached out to to give um, like lightning talks or something, and whether or not uh, they've sponsored something about the meetup, like maybe they'll sponsor the food. It can be a, on a like, case by case basis, or they might come back and say, like, actually, we'd like to sustainably sponsor you. and 
maybe for all events in February or something as a promotion for GitHub or for whatever the organization is. Usually every, or, um, GitHub would be a great one. They also have education grants that you can apply for. I think if you just Google GitHub education grants, um, they give you like little packs of swag that they send to you for your group. And um, if you're academic, if you have academic sponsorship and an academic email, um, they'll give you discounts for a lot of things that you can share with your community. Um, and I can look up the URL for that once I'm, uh, once I'm not talking. But uh, that's a great option. Did, did that at all answer your question? I don't know. I just commented on it. OK, good. All right, cool. Um, oh, yes, thank you, Marcos, for that suggestion on the R consortium. And also, our open sci, um, they might also have some funding um, to support little micro grants. Um, I don't know um, how flush they are. <laughs> but you could also speak about your study group on one of their calls and see if maybe they can promote your need for funding support. Uh, that's another option, too. Um, so great. Uh, I also put the method podcast around line two, uh, 203. And it looks like there's a bunch of tips. Um, I recommended the, the executive board or, or executive council um, identifying under undergrads or people who attend your meetings who are younger. Uh, who might have a longer tenure at the university or at the institution. Um, it's also cool to get a partner. I know like the BU study group, for example, um, is run by a librarian um, and partners also will, who updated the pad earlier, um, but couldn't be here on the call, uh, is part of that group. And so it's good to identify a librarian or someone who's staff at your university, um, if not a professor or a student to also be uh, involved with the study group because those people tend to, to stick around a lot longer than grad students or, or students. Um, and they also have quite a bit of investment in education and, and developing peer learning opportunities at the university. They also probably have some great connections for getting uh, venues and, and booking space at the university too. So sometimes it's good to get one of those folks involved. Um, and then um, develop a welcome document or packet this is something that um, I don't know if a lot of study groups do actually, and we can't. I think a lot of, or a couple of them, probably use the study group orientation guide to tell other people about what the study group is doing. But you can also just create a, a document or even an etherpad that has um, what your mission statement is and uh, where links to all of the distributed resources related to your study group, related to the management of your study group. So. The, the council roles markdown that you have or um, any of the resources for your lessons that might be in a lessons folder in your repository or any documents that you use to help plan for the next semester or figure out when your classes are gonna be. Um, you might wanna link those in a central place so that when you onboard someone, you just share a document with them and say, hey, you know, feel free to give this a read and then we can meet for 15 minutes and talk about what role you would like to fill on the, on the exec team or on the council team. Um, you end up recreating that in multiple emails over and over and over again before you convince yourself that it actually needs to be a document. <laughs> but, um, but it's good to preempt that need <laughs> by making the document. Um, and then, um, Marcos, do you want to talk about some of the advice you gave here too? Or, or is this uh, the advice you gave before? I don't know, it's split up now. There's the advice I gave before, and there's also, so, actually what I said before about uh, having s some members to lead specific meetings, I find that it's great for the group, because it's, uh, I, I don't know, I, I love leading the group, I mean, it's great, but it's also good to know that the group can function without me, so the tip I, I wrote there is that sometimes um, giving tasks for other members so they can actually lead a meeting is, is great. It's, 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 it's great in, in, in this way about uh, uh, sustaining the group because they will feel that the group exists by itself. It's not, it's not something related only to the leader. Have a sort of 
identity and ID theft import. Thank you. And then um, I think it was Lena. Well, I, Lena's from the ESB coders. I don't think she could join the call, but she said she was lurking. And she uh, recommended the board member um, model, I guess, of, of having people um, be involved with the project and then be assigned some issues, which is a nice way to get the council roles um, actionable, I guess, and easy to distribute tasks remotely. Uh, so that's great. It was great to hear from them. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? I'll put in some notes about what I said earlier about reaching out to tech companies for support. I, um, I just kind of talked and I didn't put any of those things in, but I would like to add those notes. Um, does anyone have any other questions about what or concerns about sustaining your group or advice? Nope, silence. Okay, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> I guess we covered everything, hooray. Um, I do wanna call out a couple of announcements. Um, well, uh, around line 217, this one is always in the pad actually, um, but that's because the map on the website um, isn't necessarily connected to the content of the study group listed below. Um, and I'm trying to rectify that. So if you go to the map and you notice that your study group's not there um, on the map, and that's unfortunate, and you should email me um, and say, put me on the map, Aurelia, I'd like to be there. Um, so that's the first announcement. And then the second one is uh, we're welcoming a GSOC student this year, which is the acronym for Google Summer of Code. Um, it's a very exciting program and they fund a student or Google gives funding to um, students who want to work on open source projects for three months. So we have funding for a student um, that I have to choose and they all applied last week or uh, Monday. So I have to go through the applications now, but um, all of the organization and, and, and items, action items for that project are on line two, 219. And the reason I'm mentioning it now, which I probably should have prefaced with, is because the student is gonna be working on study groups, um, but particularly on getting data and visual, creating visualizations of study group activity all over the world. So a, a couple of um, months ago, I think, I talked about the study group events repo, which is um, another little micro project um, that allows you to log Sorry, I'm looking for the URL and it's very difficult for me to actually see while I'm doing that. Um, but it's a little website where you can uh, log how many people attended your event, how successful it was, what you felt um, could be improved or how you feel like we could help you more. And uh, I kind of asked people to take a look at the form and see if it made sense to them or if it was useful. And some people gave me some feedback on that. But um, figuring out the workflow for how to get study groups to contribute their event to that site, how to make the site a little bit more interesting by adding some visualizations of like how many events per month and uh, what are the most popular event themes and that kind of thing. Um, it's something that we're hoping that this, the GSOC student will be interested in. And many, um, oh, thank you for saying that the Aberdeen study group is not on the map. I will, I will check into that after this call. But yes, so it's very exciting. We have a student who will be working with me directly for three months to, to develop some really cool visualizations of the study group project. And hopefully at that point, you'll have this nice little dashboard website that you can give to people when you reach out to them for funding for your study group. And you could say, look at all the study groups all over the world. I'm a part of this community. It's amazing. Look how vibrant it is. There's line graphs and bar charts and stuff. Um, so that's what we're hoping is going to happen. And if you have any suggestions for that repo or for the activities or issues, uh, please log them in the issues for the study group GSOC repo. Um, I put in a few issues of things that both need to be fixed with the study group project in general, things that could be developed as visualizations for study group activity all over the world, um, some data accessibility issues so that people can access data about study groups a little bit more easily because um, it's on GitHub, so that's great. GitHub is an API and you can 
for all that for all of the study groups data but getting that into a tidy little JSON that's easy to visualize or that's easy for other groups to, to have access to and that is frequently updated is something that we're working on streamlining and then um, there's also some stuff about localization and some of the students they're very ambitious and they have all reached out to me ahead of time uh, to promote their application for um, GSOC. But uh, the most popular issue I think that they're tackling is localizing the README um, as, as like their first contribution to the study group project. So I'm really proud to say that we now have translations in Hindi, uh, Chinese, and Portuguese has been updated, and, um, uh, and, and well, in English. But um, we're also working on a Spanish one that should be up this week. So we have all these translations of the README content, which is so exciting. Um, and they're all made by students. So I'm very proud of the students. They're working very hard. And um, that's another note, too. If you would like to also have access to those translated README's, um, you should uh, git pull and update your study group um, with, with the master branch so that you get access to that. Otherwise, you can just go to the repo and if you don't want to pull, and you can copy the content into your repo. Um, but uh, yes, for months, we had outdated translations, and now we have updated ones. I'm just very excited about it. Um, OK, great. So the only other updates I have, oh, I already put the study group events link on line 229. Oh, well. Um, the only other upgrades, uh, updates that I have is that the newsletter went out last week for Mozilla Science. And it was very good, um, but I used to. I usually like to feature a study group um, lead uh, in the newsletter, and this this month I featured Marcos. Thank you, Marcos. But if anybody else would like to be featured in April, please put your name on line two forty six because I would be so happy. Um, I guess Francesca, you're the only person on this call that isn't <laughs> that hasn't been featured or isn't staffed. So <laughs> I don't want to like volunteer tell you to do it, but um, if you're interested, I would love to feature you. <laughs> Um, and what was the line you were talking about? Oh, line uh, 246. Thank you. And otherwise, um, oh, and I, I talk a lot in this call, and that might be really annoying. Maybe you don't like that. Maybe you wish that there was somebody else speaking, in which case, on line 264, you can suggest yourself as the MC of the next call. Um, I always put this up, and no one ever wants to do it. <laughs> And I think it's just because it's hard to commit to a meeting a month in advance that then you're supposed to be responsible for. Um, but I set up the Etherpad for you and everything, and I'm there to help if you have any questions. So if you're at all interested in emceeing the next call, uh, feel free to put your name there. And otherwise, I have no other updates. Does anyone have any suggestions before we close? I have a question. Yes. Uh, that I just remembered. I remember uh, hearing something about um, lesson uh, repositories where all different study groups put their tutorials on, and I don't remember the link. If oh, right. Can you give it to me? I can put those. Totally. Um, oops, sorry. I'm just, I somehow minimized the study group. Okay, great. Um, yes, study group lessons. It might already be in the Etherpad somewhere, but. I'll pull it up as a separate thing. I don't know. Um, da, da, da. I will put it around um, line 231. And if you check out the issues queue in there, um, there's also a bunch of other lessons too that you can you can read through. So thank you for joining all of you. Uh, I really appreciated you coming out on a Friday um, to meet and talk about this. And I hope it was useful. Um, and I'll be sharing the video and then some more links in the Etherpad after the call. Um, so I'll tweet it out afterwards and you can revisit it later if you wanted updated content. Um, but thanks. Have a lovely Friday. Bye, everyone. Thanks.